Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello and welcome to this week's dosage of warm mineral goodness. Today is Wednesday, March 10th, and that makes this the 38th episode of Mineral Talks Live. And as many people know, the number 38 is associated with the color orange all throughout Southeast Asia. So I'm wearing this shirt today in honor of that. Not really. Anyway, we're really happy that you could join us today and we'll do our best to keep you entertained. Mineral Talks Live is the weekly mineral talk show broadcasting to you live every Wednesday. I'm Brian Swoboda, president of Blue Cat Productions, and together with my exceptional partners, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez from the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayu from the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP, we welcome you to the show. Our goal in producing this program has always been to bring together all the different facets of our mineral world, from curators and curatrics to collectors, dealers, miners, researchers, artists, and the media that serves us all. We hope that in doing so, we form a tighter bond among all of us and foster a deeper understanding of the work that everybody does in our community. Raquel, Eloise, and I try our best to bring a wide range of guests onto the show, and in doing so, we feel the show reflects the true global nature of our mineral world. By virtue of the fact that you're watching us right now, you have become part of this global network, and it's your participation to helps, that helps to make the show what it is. This is more than just a live broadcast. It's an interactive live broadcast, so your participation during the show is what makes the show really come alive. Now, there are two ways you could participate. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of buttons. There's one button labeled chat and another, another labeled Q&A. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. So when you first sign on, feel free to fire off a chat message to everyone saying hi and telling us where you're from. Also, if you have thoughts or comments about things you're seeing in the show, this is how you can share those thoughts with others. During the interview, both Raquel and Eloise will be very active in those chats, so look for their comments and links along with everyone else's. When they feel it's appropriate, either Raquel or Eloise may turn on their mics and address us directly with questions that you're asking so we can get an immediate answer from our guests while we're still on the topic. Now, the second way to interact is with the Q&A function. This allows you to submit general questions that we'll try to answer at the end of the interview. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you may see a window pop up on your screen asking a bunch of questions for our weekly poll. We do this because we think it's a fun way to learn random facts about our guests. How that information will play out in the future is anyone's guess. But if it does, then you owe us a drink, preferably something bubbly, like our personalities. Anyway, for today, we're going to head back over to the epicenter of the mineral world, Tucson, Arizona. Broadcasting to us live is a man whose name is synonymous with thumbnails. And I'm not talking about these. This is a man who grew up on the mean streets of New York City, running with gangs, crossing the street against the light, and abashedly singing falsetto to anyone willing to listen. You know, there was actually an off-Broadway musical written about him called West Siderite Story. It was an absolute smash to the five people who actually saw it. So without further delay, here is a man whose name strikes fear into the heart of Buffalgrass from Arizona to Africa, Dr. Alex Schaus. Hey, Alex, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Great to be on the show, Brian. Thanks to, uh, to all of you for inviting us and especially for the uh, topic. Uh, we don't talk to, uh, as much about thumbnail. Most of the specimens we see on your show are hand-sized or larger, so it's a real pleasure. And I also want to just recognize real quickly that there are some phenomenal thumbnail collectors uh, we have uh, around the country and around the world. And, uh, and I want to just also give them a lot of uh, credit for increasing interest in the collecting of thumbnails. Uh, folks like Alan Young, uh, Rich Jolson, Dr. Jim Haran, uh, Bill uh, Bleese, uh, just a lot of just a, pe a lot of people that have done a lot over the years to bring attention to the importance uh, that thumbnail collecting provides the, the hobby. 
Well, I think it's such a fascinating subject. And as we'll get to a little bit later, um, when you guys put in that exhibit in Munich, uh, I think that was back in what, like 15 or 16. I can't remember exactly the year, but uh, it was the year of the Africa exhibit. But when you guys put in that connoisseur case of thumbnails in the Munich show, it blew everybody away. And I think that was kind of really a true showing of the power that thumbnails have. And it was, it was brand new to the Europeans. So it was really kind of like a new thing, but it showed you, I think the, um, the down to earth honesty that people were just fascinated by thumbnails. And I think it's, it's a great topic. I mean, I love what you guys do. Well, we were really surprised when we were invited uh, that that was the first time in 49 years that the Munich show actually had an exhibit of thumbnails. And so we decided to bring five cases full of African, because that was the theme, African minerals. Uh, and we contacted thumbnail collectors and uh, curators around the world and said, if you've got a really good African uh, thumbnail, send it our way. And took us several months to collect them, bring them all out to uh, Munich. Uh, and I too, just like you, were stunned by the degree of interest uh, that we saw. <clears throat> I think for days there were five or six people in line to try to get to the front of each case. Absolutely, it was incredible. <clears throat> now, Alex, as I always like to do with a guest, I wanna turn back the clock a bit. I jest about your youth in New York City, but it was actually here where your interest in minerals began. And it's both an origin story and a mentor story. Can you share this with us? Oh, I'd be delighted to. Um, you're, you were correct in the introduction. I grew up in a terrible neighborhood. Uh, 89th Street was the headquarters of the Comanches, a gang that had over 5,000 members. Uh, most of them were Korean vets. They had a chip on their shoulder and uh, they took it out on the community in all the uh, four of the five major boroughs. So mm -hmm. organized crime took advantage of them. They ran numbers, prostitution, drugs, all kinds of things. So growing up on that very street of the headquarters, that block on which the gang was headquartered, um, basically said, when you get old enough at about 10, 11, 12 years old, you're gonna become a member, we're gonna induct you. Mm -hmm. It was not on my, uh, my radar screen to spend my life in a gang because I started seeing by the third and fourth grade, these same kids that got engaged with the gang going to reformatories uh, or dying. So little by little, our class, which started in the second grade, was lowering in numbers as we went from grade to grade as we lost wow. these members getting incarcerated or losing their life. Well, one day, uh, the friend that I was running around with, Sammy Lopez, who was uh, an immigrant from uh, Puerto Rico at the time, um, he uh, and I decided that we would spend a lot of our time roaming around the city away from that gang. Um, one day in Central Park, we saw what we thought was an outcropping that had gold and silver in it. And uh, we showed it to the teacher. And uh, actually, I have the specimen right here. There it is. And <laughs> I, I think uh, almost everybody would believe, hey, that, that's got some gold, and maybe some silver in it. So I showed it to the, uh, to the teacher. She knew nothing about geology or rocks. And so she decided to uh, send us over to the American Museum of Natural History, which just happened to be a few blocks away. So we went down Columbus Avenue. We got in the building. The guard told us to go up in the second floor. And uh, we met Dr. Frederick Poe, who we eventually got to know as Freddie. And uh, we showed him the rock. And he said, well, that's a nice rock. And I looked at him along with Sammy. I said, of course, it's a nice rock. <laughs> and so he took out a piece of paper and a pencil and he wrote down G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. And I looked at Sammy. I said, hey, this guy doesn't know. Spell. And he said, no, 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 it's a schist. <laughs> and I said, whoa, Sammy, I think he said a, a foul word. Well, that was the beginning of my relationship, which would continue for the next eight years. Um, he just felt like, you boys have got to come back. Well, Sammy had other interests. He was interested in stamps. I was interested in minerals. And so I would return over and over again. And eventually, as I got older, performed a lot of curatorial responsibilities there, would open up boxes, look where they came from, record information. And I would learn from uh, Dr. Poe 
just an awful lot about aesthetics, rarities, um, characteristics that made one specimen worth exhibiting versus another. And of course, I got to see so many of the things that are in the, in the drawers, underneath the cases, and in the back room. And he also opened up introductions. He would introduce me to uh, the Collectors Club uh, in New York. Um, he would arrange field trips. My parents did not have a car, so he would make sure some responsible adults would take me out to Connecticut, up to Maine, and to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, upstate New York, and elsewhere. And so I had an opportunity to find out how difficult it was to actually find a lot of these minerals. And so I got a real appreciation for the miners and the people who go into the quarries and what it takes to uh, bring some of these beauties of nature out for all of us to enjoy. Now, Alex, I'm going to cut to an image that I have here. And this is from um, Rocks and Minerals magazine. And I see a little kid there on the dumps <laughs> of the Franklin mineral uh, or the uh, Franklin mine. Uh, who is that kid? And this was circa 1963. Yeah, that's me. You know, when I looked at that jacket, I knew that that's my jacket. <laughs> I, I said, my gosh, who took that photograph? I'm still trying to find out who took the photograph. But yeah, that's an example of the trips we would make out there. And uh, what was wonderful about it, after an hour or two, it made me forget about the city and all the crap that was going on there. And uh, I began to realize that this was something wonderful that young people can experience um, kind of to get the stress level down, to get refocused and get interested in something that might actually have some career opportunities for them. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for now, showing that. Focus, eventually you uh, started focusing on thumbnails, but for you, it's, it's not always about perfection. So tell us about um, kind of the especially for the viewers that aren't familiar, tell us the definition of what a thumbnail is and uh, why thumbnails became your key focus. Yeah, well, uh, every once in a while, uh, we had excess number of specimens at the American Museum of Natural History. And uh, occasionally uh, he would hand over a specimen and said, Alex, I don't know what we're going to do with this, but can you just take this home, you know? And every <laughs> once in a while, I would, you know, take a Joplin uh, Galena home, uh, really heavy. I mean, more than just two handfuls. And uh, when I went, uh, and when I finally made the decision to leave New York far behind me and went to the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, um, what was really a, a problem now, when I came with a bunch of those specimens, they didn't fit in any drawers. There was hardly any room in the closets. So I went to a local mineral dealer on Central Avenue and I said, would you be willing to trade these down in size? And he looked at it and realized these were museum quality specimens and said, oh yeah, of course I will. <laughs> so uh, had I kept a few of those, um, I probably could have paid off my mortgage a long time ago. But um, anyway, it turned out that uh, with thumbnails, I could stick them in the drawer. They're in my room that I shared with uh, with another athlete. And uh, that got me into thumbnail collecting. Right on, right on. So then um, tell us what, uh, or tell the viewers what a thumbnail is. I think there's um, some confusion about uh, fitting in a perky box and explain the perky box and how thumbnails are graded in competition. Yeah, um, you know, the, the story actually begins with uh, Willard Perkin. Uh, he uh, had seen a salesman with a little box and realized that that little box could actually be used to store minerals. And that started what we now know as perky boxes. Uh, and what you're looking at is the image of, uh, uh, and, he had, and he had lived at several addresses in California. So there are various little on the backside of some of the original perky boxes an illustration of how to put a mineral into a size, a perky box. And it's not just limited, by the way, to thumbnail size. It could be for toenails or small cabinets. So he eventually manufactured enough of these and they got to become quite a business for him. And then unfortunately in 1971, he had an earthquake and a lot of the minerals that were in, dis in his display cases uh, were destroyed. But many of them that were in the perky boxes survived. And so it sort of helped a lot of people realize that this was a good way to store minerals 
on display, especially in earthquake zones. And um, so what, what happened with the um, thumbnail size perky boxes is that the box is 1.25 inches, one and a quarter inches. And uh, in competition, if you're trying to display it and, and earn some trophies or plaques or awards, some ribbons uh, for your collection, you would put them in the perky box. Uh, and then later on, people actually started mounting them on display cases, taking them out of the perky boxes, but always storing them in there. Um, so finally, uh, when I started to look at these perky boxes, I felt they were a little bit too restrictive because what a lot of times the dealer would say, well, Alex, I think that mineral is a little bit too large for you. And I would measure it and I would say, well, that's going to fit in there just fine. And so you can actually get a specimen that's 4.4 centimeters in size, uh, which is um, closer to a little over um, an inch and three quarters into, uh, into a perky box. And one of the ways that I would test it, I'm holding up this little cube. This was something that I, I had a Boeing engineer make many years ago. I've produced a whole bunch of these. I've given out a lot of these to young people and to other collectors. Um, and so I can actually put this on the specimen to see if it would fit, not necessarily standing up, but at an angle. And mm. so it, it, it allowed me to collect quite a few specimens. And there is a, um, a Whitlockite that um, I remember Bob Downs, our curator and chair, uh, not chair, but the professor of mineralogy here at the University of Arizona looked at my case and said, Alex, that's no way that that's a thumbnail. Well, I put that right over the uh, cube. And he says, oh, I'm really surprised. And so he realized that minerals that we think are too large do actually fit within the thumbnail category. And as you know, there's a category above that that's actually in competition here at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Shows and those are the toenails. And so they're, they get up to an inch and a half. And so on the, on the angle to angle, you can actually put in almost a two inch uh, specimen in there. So it allows people who wanna start off with smaller specimens, an opportunity to collect a wide range of specimens over time. Now, Alex, I'm going to kind of continue with what you're, uh, what we're seeing on the screen right now, and let shifts because I know we've got a lot of minerals that we want to take a look at, but let's actually talk about that piece that that was in the previous image. Well, it's an interesting piece because originally, uh, when it was analyzed, they thought it um, was a new species, and they named it Bob uh, Downs Knight after Bob Downs here at the university. And then there was further work done, uh, some controversy developed over whether uh, it may not have been Whitlockite and eventually that's what it turned out to be. So unfortunately for Bob Downs, who is one of the great um, mineralogists in the world and has contributed so much of his time and energy uh, to promoting mineralogy uh, in the mineral sciences, um, he lost that uh, namesake um, uh, for a species. And I thought that was really tragic. It actually happened uh, to somebody else here in Tucson, ironically, as well. We can talk about that in a moment. But typically, Whitlockite uh, is found with uh, coolancite, uh, colancite, uh, erogedite. So there are different phosphates that are normally found uh, combined uh, or around or in uh, the Whitlockite from this locality in, uh, in the Yukon. So... Um, I, I thought that it would be good to, you know, sort of show you the comparison. So to find that one single Whitlockite of that size, um, at the time that Bob looked at it, he said that may be the largest single crystal of Whitlockite. Uh, of course, I never know that unless you've seen every single specimen in the world. You never should ever tell anybody that that's the best in the world. Uh, you just don't know. You could say it's uh, one of the best or among the it's best. It's a good, it's a superb specimen. It's wonderful. It's aesthetic. Whatever terms, you know, you'd like to use, that's just fine. But that is, that really just caught my, my attention when I saw hey, that. Alex, I said, mm -hmm. can you take us over to your display case and actually show us that, um, that specimen live? <clears throat> yeah, I think I can do that. Let's see if we can take a quick walk over here. Uh, walk on the What's that? Oh, by the way, I... 
I just wanted to show you here. Um, Your nose hair? Let me see if I can, hold on. <laughs> let me see if I can return this, reverse this around. But there's a picture oh, of Fred oh, oh. That's great, who painted that? Um, I'm not sure who the painter is, but it was a gift. Um, and you can see to Alex Fred. Um, and Alex, anyway, it sounds like your hand might be covering the microphone a little bit. Whoops. Uh, let me see what's going on there. Now, you... it's, now, it's, now it's okay. Okay, thank you. So um, you can see there to Alex Fred, Fred Pocard there. Um, this actually came as a gift from Marshall Sussman, who had mm. received uh, this painting. So I'll have to check with him. But I thought it was just a wonderful way to remember a man who uh, made a real difference in my life, life and was a really wonderful mentor. So if we go over to the case here, uh, what you'll see is I've actually designed a way in which you can put the mineral on a mount and then insert it into uh, the risers. And then you can put a label in front of it. So Clever. if we're looking for that particular specimen, um, oh my, I'll have to find it. <laughs> <laughs> there are... There are so many here in these cases. But I don't think anyone is minding the search along with you. <laughs> if anyone can find it before Alex finds it, you get to keep it. I found it. There it is. Oh. <laughs> so we'll see it in the back. I've got, a, I've got the glass up so um, I don't accidentally hit one of the minerals. But I think so you can see it. Just to the there. right of the amzonite, the blue amzonite in the middle of the screen. That's right. There's an amzonite quartz with, uh, and then to the other side, a pyrolusite, correct? And next to that, a brucite. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there's the specimen. And in this way, I can display an awful lot of different species, different habits, colors, crystallography, um, associations. One of my favorite of all cases is this one here, it's a smaller case, because I love showing this to young people. Um, I try to stress that it's not about the money. I try to show them that there are fabulous species found in mineralogy for which there are so many varieties that come from that species, you can build an entire collection around that. Uh, Al Murrow, who was a good friend of Bill Pinch in, in Rochester, uh, New York, had thousands of, of uh, pyrites at one time. And it was just fascinating going through all of those. So what I show the children here is I start off, sometimes uh, we actually have some stools for them to stand up on. And so we start off on the top here with calcites and we work our way down to the pyrites and marcosites. And then we get down here into quartzes and then we get down to what some people call black uglies, or I think they're just gorgeous, the hematites and galenas. So it shows a lot of the variety of crystallography, the forms. Uh, we can teach them crazy words like uh, diphenaity, <laughs> which we'll talk about <laughs> later. Uh, diphenaity is the uh, characteristic where you have luster and translucence at the same time. Um, we also point out how inexpensive they are. And we encourage them that if they find a specimen they really, really love, that they take that they show it to the, um, the dealer if they're at a show and, uh, and see if you can negotiate the price down because some of these thumbnails have gotten a little bit more expensive. And as a result, a child with $20 in their pocket can't really buy as many specimens as we might have. When, certainly when I was much younger or a child, um, I could probably buy half of, of any one of these uh, uh, shells for 20 to $50 back uh, 40, 50 years ago, but that's not possible anymore. So, but the kids, they, they're absolutely fascinated by it. And actually when I do this, I keep the other two cases covered. I have covers for those oh, other good. two that keeps the dust out because I don't want them to start looking at emeralds and rhodochrosites and you know, beautiful uh, lagrandites and things like that and, and have them suddenly realize that that's completely out of their um, economic ability. 
Um, so those are sort Alex, of I've brought up I've brought up a Marcus site because you had mentioned Marcus site. I brought up a Marcus site on my screen, and wow. I know that this is it's a beautiful specimen. You can see the details in the photo here, and mm -hmm. I don't I don't know who shot this photo. It was either Mark or Jeff Scovel. Uh, maybe you knew off the top is of it, your head. Is it the one from the? Oh yeah, that's right, right in front here. Um, that's that's, uh, that's a uh, I believe a Mark Monsner uh, photo. Uh, that's a beautiful uh, specimen from the Ziegler mine near Sparta in Randolph County, Illinois. Um, boy, when I saw that, I just fell in love with it. And uh, it's been one of my, my absolute favorites. Uh, and so, in other words, here's an example of a marcosite rather than a gemmy crystal uh, that um, just knocks your socks. And uh, everybody you know, who looks at that case, it, they just are drawn to it immediately. And ironically, right next to it is this fantastic pyridohedral from the Groundhog Mine in Gilman um, uh, of uh, Eagle County, uh, Colorado. And uh, this one's been on posters, on postcards. Um, it's won uh, in, uh, in 2018 and won the best with theme for um, thumbnail during the Crystal Crystal Forms competition that year at the TGMS show. Now, what's so wonderful about that is I saw that on the internet, and uh, that came from, I, I ordered it right away, and um, he told me that within one hour of him putting that on right after I purchased it, he had almost 80 other collectors trying to get it. They all realized what a phenomenal specimen this was, and so there's a beautiful picture of it. Um, this is also a Mark Monsner uh, photo, um, and uh, he really captured that just the way it needed to be shown. But that's, so that's Alex, an example. So these two pieces being in that case, I'm sorry, these two pieces being in that case, I'm sorry, meaning, Marcus, means, I was going to say, Marcus, I usually fall apart, um, mm -hmm. and so that's something, you, you know, you have to teach. So the mentoring is really important, um, but the Marcus site that sits next to the pyridohedral um, pyrite is one from Cap Blanc Nice in France and uh, from Pas de Lake. And, and when you look at that one, uh, those have been very, very stable. But sometimes what happens, they also uh, get pseudomorphed. And in this case, right next to it is one of a limonite pseudomorphed after marcosite. And this one's from the White Desert in Egypt. And so we can show the children a lot of different things just on one single uh, line of these risers um, to help them to understand how they can be just collecting marcosites or hopefully not a lot of marcosites, but a lot of pyrites in particular, because they form, there's so many different crystal forms. So now, Alex, these being in that case means that they are uh, less expensive than some of the other pieces that are in, in your collection. Is there a below number that these pieces fall in, like below 1,000, below 500? Uh, where where oh, does I it say, range? I would say most of these, I paid less than 50, 50 or $75. For wow. Most of them. Yeah. And, and some of them, I did pay a bit more a few hundred dollars, just, you know, the prices have been going up, but uh, it does show you that children can, can acquire it. Now, remember, I've been collecting thumbnails now for over 50 years. And so if I go back to the old desert in days, uh, even before there was a Tucson uh, convention center uh, show, uh, which I think started around uh, 1982, but I could be wrong. But, um, you know, at that time, people weren't very much interested in, in a lot of these, what they thought were very common and abundant crystals. But I found out if you find something you really just fall in love with, go ahead and get it. And, and certainly the best time to get specimens is where there are a lot of them in abundance. Move it around. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Absolutely. So, hey, Alex, uh, let's, uh, let's go yeah. back to a, um, we, we had hinted at it earlier. This was a mineral that was formerly known as something else. This is the Marshall, the formerly known Marshall Sussmanite. Um, 
I think this is in your other cases. If you can uh, talk about this and maybe show us the live piece in your in your case. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, this was uh, the Marshall Sussman night. Uh, again, it later on determined on further analysis to be uh, a shizzleite uh, from the Wessels mine uh, in South Africa. Uh, it was a real pity because, uh, and this, that photo, by the way, was taken by Marshall Sussman. And when he came over, you know, to, to look at it in the case, now he had looked at as many of the Marshall Sussmanites as he was given an opportunity to look at. At the time, he said that Alex could be possibly the largest single crystal um, of Marshall Sussmanite. Well, we now know it's uh, shizzleite. And as a result, uh, it, it may or may not be. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. I just thought it was a wonderful specimen, especially for color. Uh, it's got that wonderful pinkish, reddish color. So, um, yeah, that was, that was one of my faves. And I can uh, take you over to the case, and uh, we should be able to find it somewhere in here. <laughs> so. And again, if, if the viewers can find it before Alex can, then Alex will gleefully ship that to you. Uh, is that the deal? You may have okay. to pay for shipping, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, the shipping's about five thousand dollars. So exactly, um, that was I your out. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll find it somewhere in here. Um, I'll just keep looking around, see if I can find it. Um, How many pieces in your collection, Alex? Yeah, and yeah, and by the way, sometimes what I do is I actually pull the specimens out, but I did find it. It's right back there, and you'll see it uh, sort of between the uh, albiite and the uh, scolocyte. Um, you'll see it right there. So um, really a beautiful specimen, and, of course, the color really stands out. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Hey, continuing on our theme of minerals named after people, you've got uh, this one that we filmed at the 2020 uh, Tucson show. Uh -huh. That is the... Laurent Thomasite. Right. And that one, I, I know exactly where that one is. Just got to get my camera on it. So there we are. So you can be able to see that one. Yeah, it doesn't look like very much, does it? <laughs> it doesn't until you put a light behind it. <laughs> oh, and then things really uh, goes crazy. Uh, it has the stichromism. And uh, what happens is when you shine a light on one side, you'll see this vivid blue color. And then you pay, take it at an angle, and guess what? You get this vivid, brilliant yellow. Uh, and so this is uh, one of these pleochromic uh, minerals, and it's, it's just fabulous. But by the way, what's interesting, this specimen sat in a dealer's booth for almost two, three days. And uh, I walked in there, and I'd never heard of a Laurent Thomasite. And it turned out it was a brand new species and uh, is, it's the newest gem that we can now add to our gemstone collecting. So uh, this is a particularly fine specimen. And shortly after these were uh, identified, very, very few uh, have been found since then. It's absolutely uh -huh. beautiful. I remember when uh, Laurent was sharing it with us uh, for What's Hot in Tucson. He was just giddy as a kid that uh, both he had it and that it was named after him. Absolutely. Right, right. right. Exactly. Exactly. So where do you want to go to next? Well, let's take a look at this, uh, this lovely silver that we have here. So this one is way in the back. Um, and it's actually uh, a toenail. It's not a thumbnail. Uh, I could have made it into a toenail if I squished it, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. Uh, you might well, come have. On. Do it live. Do it live. Come on, Alex. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard people do things like that, but not not this kid. <laughs> um, Fred Poe would turn over in his grave if I did that. So um, I would uh, I would simply say what really caught my eye. There's a nice story behind this one. Uh, it's from the Proana uh, mine um, in Zacatecas, uh, uh, Mexico. And if you picked it up, it's as light as a feather. No kidding. I mean, you really don't. You, you, if you put it in your hand. If you you were blindfolded, you'd say, "Well, have you put it in my hand yet?" And yet you're holding it. It's that light, 
And it's so amazing um, uh, of all these silver fibers uh, interlaced uh, between themselves. It's a 3.3 centimeters, by the way, it, it is the uh, width of it, and 3. Point, uh, centimeters, 3.0 centimeters uh, by height. So it's a, an exceptional specimen. Um, uh, because uh, so few of these were found in Fresno, uh, Mexico, at the Pronana Mine, uh, Jeff uh, actually sent me a photograph he took when this specimen was uh, identified. And uh, it's a wonderful, a so that's a great, that's a, I believe, uh, yeah, that's a Mark Monson photo also. Wonderful. Hey, yeah. so Alex, let's go back to my former home state of California, and you've got a killer Benitoite here. Oh, this is the yeah. state gemstone of California. Yeah. And again, Alex is looking for it and there, I'm probably there picking it ones. Is. Oh, there it is right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's just a wonderful. Um, so this is this, um, the locality has this hydrothermal serpentinite um, and it just produces these phenomenal benitoites. And uh, this was in Vihart's, uh, Vihart's collection, a uh, personal collection for many, many years, and he finally decided to let it go. I had another fine Benitoite, Jim Benitoite, but I love this one in particular because it's sitting on a pedestal, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it just displays beautifully. Yeah, the way it displays uh, is, is spectacular. It's as yeah. if nature were holding it up and saying, here, check this out. Right, exactly, exactly. And he considered one of the five finest that he had ever uh, been identified. Uh, and, of course, he, he, knew, he knows his Benitoites because he's done a lot of mining there, Benitoites, uh, over the years. So, Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, next up on my slide list, I have a, a uh, fabulous Carolite. And we're going to actually show two Carolites because they're from... Uh, the same area, but much different years. So why don't you tell us about this one and then we'll look at the more recent one and maybe you can show us uh, where these are in your in your display case. Yeah, uh, this one, let's see, uh, they're, in, they're in separate display cases. So of course, I'll I don't make to... anything easy for you. No, no that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> we, we still get it along just fine. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, the uh, the first one I know in the first uh, slide is up here in the back, and it's kind of a little bit harder to see, but it's sitting between that fantastic rondonite from Peru and uh, the rubellite uh, elbiate uh, with lapidolite from Brazil from the Jonas mine, um, and so the the curlite that we're looking at in the case right now is the one that is the most recent find. Uh, from right around uh, 2015, 16, 17. Uh, they didn't find too many in the pocket, but uh, this one was, uh, was an exceptional one from the Camoya South 2 mine uh, in Cambo, uh, Zaire. And if I'm lucky, I might be able to find the other one. Um, and let's see if we can find that as I'm traveling around. This is great because the viewers also get a chance to look at, uh, look at your cases. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, as I, I, I'm sometimes I'm kind of not going as fast as I should to help the audience get to what you would like to show them because it's just some of these specimens knock my socks, you know, when I get to see them again. <laughs> Uh, because uh, I do cover the, the cases up to keep any dust out of there and um, and That's also why we because call you short have, attention spans shouse. <laughs> and also because you have a young person come in here, I don't want them to see these right away. Um, right. And, and then really not get an understanding of, and also I'd like to see them really um, take the, the hobby a little bit more seriously. So I can give them magazines. Uh, I can uh, loan books out to them. And uh, those who I begin to see really are spending time reading the material and learning uh, going on field trips with the Mineralogical Society of Arizona, which does a fantastic job of taking children and their family out to quarries and mines around the state and around the region. And uh, when I see that they're really serious, then I, uh, 
I'll spend a lot more time with them and and bring them along uh, to encourage them Alex, to learn. Alex, sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt. We have a question. What is that blue in the back? I believe is the back all the way at the the blue all the way, the way at the back? back there. Yes. Well, that's a, that's an azurite disc. Um, uh, yeah. That's from uh, the. Uh, my bunk of uh, copper mine in Western Aranda County, Northern Territory, Australia. That, is that that's the one the that, uh, that Dean is uh, bringing out? Yeah, yeah. Aren't those just the vivid blue color? Good eye, whoever the uh, questioner was. We yeah. I'm going to go off topic because... and say, hey, what's, can, you open, can you lift up one of those uh, uh, foam shields that you have? Uh, you mean the first eye, <laughs> the Rialgar? Yeah. Well, yeah. you, you understand the reason why they're covered, but yeah. I mean, we could do that if you'd like. Yeah, 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 let's do that. We're going yeah, off script here, ladies and gentlemen. So Laura's going to do that, and I'm going to open up the case and take that off so you can see that. Um, yeah. Oh, now it's much steadier. I think Laura needs to keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, well, she's better at everything by the way, than I am, so. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lord, down the bit. Right there. There it is, on the right TV. side. There we yeah. go, to the right. Yeah, it's got fabulous luster. Look at that. Laura, I'm craning my neck to the right. Can you see oh, that? Oh, see, I'm sorry. So there you see go. back here, I, I use this, uh, when I'm out in the field and, and it's getting dark, I can keep writing notes with this pen, which has a light at the end. But you can, can see it that way. Maybe sometimes you can see the light that way. Terrific, wow. So yeah. Alex, how is your collection array? You mentioned something about color, but now I see different species, which I'm trying to make a sense of your arrangement. Right, well, for those, uh, species that I mentioned earlier that I try to get kids interested in because all of those species are affordable. But the next thing I encourage them to learn to do is to acquire what they really like um, and, and, and help them by seeing as they see more and more of these specimens and I've got many more boxes that I can show them, I can help them to see what aesthetics really is about, what associations are really about, crystallography, how one species can take on so many different forms and colors. And so my collection really is not uh, about purity uh, in any way. It's not about perfection, although there's quite a few specimens that I guess you would say they're close to about as perfect as they can get. Um, just look at that copper, for example, that's sitting between uh, the rhodochrosite and the wolfenite with mimetite. I mean, that's just a wonderful specimen. Again, it sat in a room and uh, the moment I saw it, I just fell in love with it. So you know, you've got copper replacing cuprite and these very fine, you look under the microscope, extraordinary copper specimens. And we have a microscope here and I can show them um, under different power, some of the things that you can't see uh, with the naked eye just to get a greater appreciation of the crystallography that's occurring uh, as these specimens are being created. Nice um, here's we a, have a question, Alex. Sorry again to interrupt. Sarah would like to know for the, what are the two blue on the right lower side? Uh, <laughs> not up here, blue. On the right lower set. On the right lower chest. I think, yeah, maybe you pass then. Uh, you mean on the second case or the first one? <laughs> on the other case where you wear. The other case, okay. There are two blues. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Some... Ah, this is a pretty unusual mineral, a ceruleite. Um, this one's from Chile. And uh, these are really hard to find. As you probably know, um, as a museum curator, you, you just don't come across many of these. And so this was a wonderful find. It's a wonderful blue color. That's what that is. And up here, there's another blue, and that's a linarite that's sitting between a stellarite uh, from Kazakhstan and a, a banisterite 
from uh, Broken Hill, New South Wales. And uh, these, of course, come from the Grand Reef Mine here in Laurel Canyon in Graham County, Arizona. Let's go hey, through Alex, all the blues. I know you have a cop. What's that, Raquel? If we could go through all the blues. I think there were a few more blues above. They're very rare. Yeah, I yeah, think on the yeah, next shelf are. up, you had two blues in a row, uh, kind of towards the right part of the shelf. Well, there's another linarite right, right linarite. here. There's a linarite mm -hmm. right there between the wolfenite and the dioptase. And if I take this off, um, that's a realgar sitting there in the front. So keep that oh, yeah. covered Look again. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if you blinked, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> rewind, rewind, instant playback. Look at that Smithsonite. That's crazy. Hey, uh, I got I got to tell you about this one. Um, this is this uh, Rebecca uh, variety crocodilite, and uh, this is an, uh, one of the six different types of asbestos. Um, this was the type of asbestos mm -hmm. in South Africa and from uh, Bolivia that was used in Kent cigarettes with a uh, uh, filter tip they called micron light. And uh, so you were getting not only the cadmium in the paper, which is an interesting story, they added the paper, they added cadmium to the paper of cigarettes uh, right around 1950, because it made the paper burn a little faster since cadmium had a low melting temperature of 775 degrees. And as a result, the tip of the cigarette was about 1200 degrees so if you put your cigarette in an ashtray and you went out on the dance floor to dance and you came back, the cigarette still burned. And this solved the problem for the tobacco industry because they had, uh, they needed everyone to have matches or a lighter uh, to re relight the cigarettes because uh, the, there was no combustion that was continuing. And this way the combustion would continue and the cigarettes would continue to burn right down to the filter tips. So people then realized for decades that they were getting exposed to a potent neurotoxin in the paper on top of 26 carcinogens in the tobacco. And then in the filter tip, just to add injury, injury to, uh, insult to injury, you would now have asbestos as well. And so when Bill Pinch saw this particular specimen, I remember Laura said, OK, now you spent hours here looking at all of these thumbnails. What's your favorite one? And he pointed to that one and she almost fell off her chair because she was so surprised. Why would you, of all the specimens in Alex's case, pick this as your, your favorite? And he said, because I've never, ever, ever seen a terminated one. And it, lo and behold, it turned out that was true. It's extremely rare to see them terminated. And so, yeah, I remember he spent maybe 15 minutes under the microscope looking at that termination. So there it Alex, is. Alex, I brought up a photo that you sent me of the same piece. I think uh -huh. here you can really kind of see the details of it. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. People wonder why smoking is not good for you. <laughs> but I bet you a lot of people didn't know about the cadmium in the, in the uh, paper. But, so Alex, uh, how many packs are you down to these days? <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I learned that from a, a, a pediatrician in, um, in, in, uh, in Ohio who was struggling with children with uh, eating dis uh, with uh, attention deficit disorder. And uh, all of a sudden, the school districts around her started having more and more cases. And what had happened in the adjoining state of Illinois uh, and Indiana, they had opened up a facility to start burning uh, refuge, and they didn't have any way to filter out the heavy metals, particularly the cadmium. And they were burning a lot of tires, and the tires contain cadmium in there. Uh, it helps in the hardening of, of the rubber. And so as soon as she realized that, she recognized that these children um, would have a zinc deficiency as a result of their overexposure to the cadmium. And as she improved their zinc status and started using um, a drug to excrete the uh, cadmium out, the children's uh, hyperactivity started to completely go away and they were back in regular classrooms. So, um, so boys and girls, don't smoke your tires. Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, this was something that Fred Poe uh, taught me is uh, you have to be careful handling some of the specimens because they contain toxic elements. And uh, this led me years later as I, um, you know, got into the fields of nutrition and uh, physiology and botanical medicine and natural product science that I started to realize there was a real need uh, for somebody to write about uh, some of the concerns we have with some of the elements and how they affect our health or our, our behavior. And that included a book I wrote some years ago called uh, Minerals, Trace Elements, and Human Health. And uh, it, it was really a way of uh, saying thank you to Fred Poe for helping me to realize that this was an important subject for all society to know a lot about, and that a lot of these specimens can be used to catch their attention uh, in terms of the wonderful things that nature produces, uh, but yet that some of these things that look so nice cannot necessarily be so good for us. Absolutely. Well, Alex, you have another interesting story about um, minerals helping people, and it's tied to this image that's up on my screen right now. And as well, you're telling that story, maybe the girls could go ahead and launch the the uh, the poll. And Alex, if you see a screen come up, you can just close it and ignore it. But uh, this is a killer piece from the Rowley mind that also has a wonderful story to it. So maybe you can share the story and then hunt for this piece in your in your display case. Okay, good enough. Yeah, I think, well, there's there's several of them in here. So it's just I got lucky, and um, it was uh, Rosemary uh, Roberts who had asked me when I first came here in 2010, uh, moving down from Washington State to Tucson, she said there was a minor uh, here in Arizona who was in the hospital in Las Vegas and could possibly die of lead poisoning. And, uh, and she said, do you know of anything that could be done? Because they had tried EDTA and chelation therapies and all types of things. They just couldn't get it out. So I asked her to have uh, the minor's uh, medical report sent to me uh, didacted, so I didn't need to see their name. And he had 440 micrograms per deciliter of lead. Now, that may not mean much to most of the listeners, but it, it was shocking when I saw a number that high. And just because I'd never seen a human being that was alive with a number that high, I sent it to a colleague at the uh, USDA Human Nutrition Research Center in Fargo, North Dakota, who has been studying heavy metals for most of his life. And he called me, he says, Alex, why are you studying cadavers? And so he <laughs> obviously told me that uh, this man could die. And I remembered that on a trip to um, Hungary, there was a deposit of a black material a soil, just soil. Um, near Lake Balakan, and uh, I was able to make arrangements for that brown, uh, black soil to be sent uh, from Hungary to Canada. Somebody drove it down to our Seattle office. Uh, then from there, it was FedEx to me here in Tucson, and I then, with instructions, sent it to the doctors uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, that was, his report was July 1st, and two months later, on September 1st, his blood lead levels were down to 40 micrograms per deciliter with no injury to his kidney. And uh, it's an interesting story because that powder was one of the reasons why the Soviets moved in on the 1956 revolution in Budapest uh, because they needed that powder oh, they because they were giving it to uh, people in uh, the Soviet Union who were engaged in mining activity or uh, in a metal um, fabrication plants around the country uh, who are getting exposed to these heavy metals. And they found it was ex extremely useful in removing very safely and very quickly these heavy metals. Um, and so um, obviously the man's life was saved. And interestingly enough, um, he uh, and I ran into each other in a small room at the Denver Gem and Mineral Show uh, a few weeks into September of that same year. And he was sitting on a chair and somebody said, oh, Alex, how are you? And he, he said, Who, who's Alex? And the guy, oh, that's Alex Schaus. And he said, he just got out of his chair right away as did Danny uh, Sotomayor, who they now, they're married today. And mm -hmm. um, she worked in the mine as well with him. 
And, you know, he held me for quite a while and tears flowed and my, my shoulder got a little wet. And, and I, uh, I was just very glad that he was okay and that, 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 that powder could save his life. That's so, absolutely fantastic. And yeah. so and then, then I started helping. Um, you he honored my, you later, later in life, right? Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, later his second son, his name is Alexander. So um, I went into the rally mine at his invitation and I've always enjoyed getting into mines and started going into mines at the Kelly mine back in 1967, 68, 69, pulling out beautiful boy, Smith Smithsonite's. And, um, you know, I got in the mine and, and he gave me a 45 pound chipper and I could spend 10 hours chipping for him. And then I would muck for him. And, you know, over time, I got some pretty good specimens out of, uh, out of some of the work that was done there. Alex, Fantastic. sorry, I think we, a few of us miss what kind of powder, maybe you said the, is the powder from the wolf tonight? That's the one you were talking? Uh, is the no, black it powder? From, yeah. It wasn't from the wolfenite, but it, it was unrelated. But, no, it's uh, unrelated. Yeah. Yeah. It's but unrelated. What, what was the powder? Did you ever figure that out? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did the chemistry on it. Um, and I also flew back to Hungary when I first was exposed to it some years earlier. Uh, traveled out there with a physician from California who alerted me to this deposit. And, uh, and, I, and I had some work done on translating some of the early uh, scientists in Russia at the University of Moscow who actually discovered its attributes in 1952-53. And, uh, and so the Soviet Union, was, Soviet Union could really accelerate uh, their industrialization because of this one mineral. So um, it's called humifulvate, by the way, and uh, it's, it's unique. And I know people have tried to recreate it by adding humic acid with fulvic acid, but it doesn't have the same characteristics as uh, this deposit. By the way, this has now uh, been uh, 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 acquired by the government, and uh, it's almost impossible to get onto that, that site. So they realize what a treasure they have there. Great. Can you- Alex, uh, we're kind of coming to the end of our hour. I'm, I want to uh, show one more uh, piece and maybe you can yeah. find it in your collection. And then I'm going to ask you if you can just kind of do a pan of all your shelves, just so everyone can kind of see the depth of it and uh, uh, feel jealous that they're not there in Tucson. But the piece I want to focus on, first of all, is a tourmaline uh, or from the tourmaline group that is yep. unlike any that anyone has ever seen, or at least that I've ever seen. Yeah, this Talk Luana, uh, this is an exceptional radial spray. And uh, it's from uh, the, uh, the Bald Hornet claim in North Bend uh, in King County, which Seattle's in King County, Washington. Uh, this was a specimen, it was $26. And it sort of uh, helps you to understand that there are still plenty of wonderful specimens out there that are very, very affordable. But who would have known that Luana is in the tourmaline group? And, uh, it, you know, this is where reading, learning about minerals is extremely valuable because it gives you an added advantage when you know more about as many specimens as you can learn about. And I think as far as what we can see with a visible eye, uh, we probably could put together about 2,800 specimens. I think that might be, opti uh, optim uh, I guess we call it optically uh, visible. Uh, and then, of course, we have all the micro specimens, which we could add another couple of thousand easily there. So I think there's about 5,600 different mineral species uh, in the world that have been identified to date. So, uh, Alex, look, could you show us that in the case? Uh, yeah, I, let's see if I can find that as well. Uh, where would I put that? And again, uh, one thing I should mention, I, I sometimes um, do replace minerals just to put new things out there for people who are visitors. So they get to see things that they haven't seen before. Oh, I just got to show this one to you just for one second. Do you see the Iowaite on brucite? That used to be a terrific brucite until those brucites up there, those yellow ones from Pakistan, yellow, from yellow. Balistan, started to appear. And they knocked our socks because of the wonderful, vivid yellow colors. But that used to be a fantastic specimen. And it still is. 
Um, so I'm still looking. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what this is what we're dying to see right here. Oh, and I think um, Raquel might be getting a little motion sickness, but uh, heck, if we can see these, then it's worth it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I uh, I've caught a few rarities in the lower shelves. And it's been fun to have people with a lot of years of experience in minerals see things, they go, I've never seen one of these. Here was a, a Fergusonite yttrium specimen as an example. Could you center that in the in the frame, Alex? Oh yeah, so sorry a little about bit that. To your right. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go, yeah. Thank you. A <laughs> uh, really cute specimen, by the way, is this uh, pyrotized ammonite on um, on a, a pyrite ball from Aden in New York, all the New York. That's just lovely. And here's an old uh, one that was collected many years ago from uh, Butte, uh, Silver County in Montana, a nice uh, wire silver. Um, here's a pretty rare one, uh, Simpsonite um, Ceruleum from these Aggie Mountains in Pakistan. Uh, wonderful Bildenite, Bildenite twin there. Uh, one you don't see too often. Um, a little further over is a Argentinotenonite. And I'm gonna move back. Oh, I love so the and matrix that you have there. Yeah, here's another one that recently been coming out of the Austinites um, mm. on a Seno Siderite. So I would mention that all of the specimens that I have in the case, I've, I've, I've had Raman or additional an analytical work done on. So the uh, Magnesio Ferrite, uh, that is from the 1890s. And uh, it's when uh, the... Um, uh, Summa Vesuvius complex uh, volcano had exploded and that's when those were collected. And so those wow. you don't see too often. And then there's unusual specimens that, you know, people don't take too much of an interest in, but you just don't see it like a safflorite. That's a kind of a, an unusual rate. So uh, a lot of wonderful specimens in there um, that we, there's so many of them here. Uh, it's just fun to look at. Um, what I also, oh, and, uh, and these are one of these new uh, goals. What is that? What is that? Could you pull back a little bit? Yeah, we can pull back. There we go. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, and then there's a wonderful uh, Kavdorskite. Nice blue color. It was gold before, right? That's right, yeah. Gold. And uh, by the way, Wendell Wilson has another one of these uh, blue Kavorskites, another one, he has a wonderful specimen. Uh, the Etringite, I was actually in Johannes, uh, in Cape Town, South Africa in August, 1983, when these Etringites and related minerals were found and I actually helped bring up the first 20 flats uh, by the miner who found these. Um, and uh, we, when we were carrying them, I had 10, he had 10 flats. I thought they were empty. And as uh, those who are familiar with these specimens like Chalcite, Etringite, uh, they know uh, Sturmanite that they're very, very light. And, uh, and that is because of, uh, of their composition. They have a lot of water in them. Uh, here's a wonderful. I, I filmed uh, that piece of yours for the Mineral Perspectives uh, um, project that we did together. That's right. That's born and night. Yeah. Beautiful specimen from China. And a little further down here is another really interesting specimen you don't get to see. According to Brian Cosner, it's one is maybe one of the finest uh, metastibnites um, ever found in um, in Bolivia. And there's a wonderful, beautiful gemmy. Uh, fluorocalco uh, microlite next to it. And then above it, here's another wonderful specimen you don't see too often, a beautiful jemmy thomasite. 
And Alex, then keep going in that direction because I think I saw your Lagrandite back there. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And there's a wonderful, uh, ceru the cer uh, you know, heart-shaped cerusite twin. Uh, and that's from Morocco. Um, and uh, the uh, we went, uh, we, we were going in that direction. And of course, uh, you got to have a good pyrophyllite eventually. So there's a really fine twin, uh, beautiful color, a uh, topaz, a uh, nambulite, a very rare mineral from the combat mine. Uh, this really fabulous, uh, and especially for form, this bornite uh, from uh, the uh, DRC, from the Combov district. And next to it, a beautiful uh, Goshenite. And next to it, I've had this one for probably 30 years, this Anglocyte, maybe 40 years, from Morocco. And here's a wonderful go to Froite. Above that, you'll see a Scorderite. Beautiful Aftonite, beautiful uh, Meadow Autonite, lovely uh, Ludlakite. There's a fabulous, fabulous metatorbonite, which has that diaphaneity that I described earlier, this characteristic of uh, transparency and uh, luster. Now, one of my absolutely favorite minerals is the wolfenite with mimidite. The composition, the uh, association, this is just a beautiful specimen. We talked about the copper, beautiful uh, beryl emerald, uh, the fluorapatite, which has been several articles written about that one. Um, this is interesting. This is corkite. Now, it's not the prettiest specimen in the world, but um, I actually did uh, a test because uh, it came with a label that said with gertite that actually turned out to be hematite. So we're going to get that label changed around. Just did that a month ago. Um, there's a, a wurzite. Um, here's a tongue twister, uh, bismutotantalite, say oh, that 10 times wow. fast. Yeah. <laughs> and then above there, there's a really nice, um, Armonite, a twin, Pezotatite, a wonderful Cubanite that I got from, uh, Gilbert Hernault at the Old Desert Inn, I think in 1972 or right around that time. Um, so that was much more affordable, beautiful, the cell, the celluliite, um, striking Lagrandite. There's that Lagrandite. Yeah, that's a beautiful spray and calcocyte. Um, let's see, we'd have to open up more of the case. Uh, I think the rondonite up there is just a knockout. Just jamming beautiful specimen. Fabulous, fabulous pentagonite. And by the way, uh, pentagonites are really hard to find anymore. So if anybody's hoping to get a good specimen, I say if you see one, get it. Go back and focus on that if you would, Alex. Uh, put the camera on it. Yeah. There, uh, a little, yeah, a little bit to the right. There we, there go. we go. And my understanding is where that was found, it's all paved over in apartments or shopping centers are built on top of it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. That That's what has happened. And a wonderful, beautiful Marialite. Hey, Alex, unfortunately, we're 10 minutes past the hour. So we have gone over, as I predicted we would. And so, um, I mean, we can honestly go on for like two hours, but uh, yeah. uh, people are going to have to come visit you in uh, Tucson and uh, see for themselves. Yeah. So right now we're going to do the part of the show that I really love, which is the five quick fire questions. You know how this works, right? I have five questions. Each question has two answers. You have to give me your gut reaction on which answer you prefer. And all of our viewers have already submitted their answers. And so we just, all of your answers are Correct. So we're just trying to see how well people know Alex Schaus. Ready? Well, I hope so. Okay. Let's flip your camera around so we can see your beautiful green eyes. All right. <laughs> are your eyes? What, what color are your eyes? <laughs> Blue. Blue. Okay. All right. Close but that metatorb that metatorbinite might have had other properties, maybe changing eye color. You never know. 
<laughs> Wouldn't that be fun if that became like a Crayola color, metatorbonite <laughs> green? I'm sure Peter Lickberg is like, yeah, 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 yeah. We could name Volvo's that. <laughs> You'd make a great scientist. You think out of the box. I love that. Oh, there about you go. You. Okay. Quick, five quick fire uh, questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Question number one, acai or goji berry? <laughs> acai. Acai, of course. Question number two, butter or margarine? Butter. Question number three. This is this is a tough one. Uh, chalupa or chehule? Chalupa. Chalupa, really? <laughs> Question number four, and people really need to know you to figure this one out. P618 or R2D2? P16. <laughs> And the final question, Maui or Oahu? Maui. Maui, yep. Okay. Um, all right. Eloise, are we ready with the answers? Yes, we are. Okay. N question number one was acai or goji berry? Alex answered acai. What did the viewers say? Acai as well. They know Mr. Shaus. Question number two, butter or margarine? Alex answered butter. What did the viewers say? Butter as well. Margarine. I didn't even know that existed in, in, in the U.S. either. Seriously. Oh, don't get Alex started because he's got a whole hour <laughs> story to tell just on margarine. <laughs> Question number three, chalupa or chihule? We have chalupa. Chalupa. Wow. I actually would have gotten that one wrong. Uh, question number four, P618 or R2D2? Well, we got the R2D2. R2D2. <laughs> so D2. Right. We, you have to explain what the P618 uh, is at some point, please. Well, right. let's finish the last question, okay. and then we'll okay. let Alex explain uh, P618, sure. otherwise known as Shaus Pink. Uh, question number five, Maui or Oahu? We got Maui as well. Good, great. Alex's son lives on Maui, so I, I predicted he would have guessed that. Alex, um, why don't you talk real quickly about um, uh, Shaus Pink or P618, and then we're going to go to the Q&A. Sure. Um, P16, uh, we were working on research when I was research director up at City University in Seattle, uh, trying to understand how colors and lights affect human behavior and health. And I started working on a color, uh, which we discovered had profound effects quicker than an injectable tranquilizer in reducing body strength. So if you were lifting uh, weights, all of a sudden you couldn't wait, you couldn't lift them at all. And then I would take the color away and you'd start lifting again. And we started using this in a, um, in a prison setting uh, with the U.S. Naval Correctional Facility in Seattle with the Pentagon's per approval. And where they used to have one assault of staff each day uh, after six months of using these pink rooms uh, with this Baker Miller pink, uh, they were down to one episode per six months. And, and you know, you don't need to do, be a statistician to realize something very profound has been discovered. We started testing that in uh, San Jose, California, in their county jail, in juvenile facilities in San Bernardino County. Uh, as well up in Lane County, uh, Eugene, Oregon, and then in Canada and around the world. It became very famous and was shown on that. It's incredible. And uh, there have been uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of stories been uh, given on, including, for example, the uh, uh, professional sports. I remember <laughs> the day I got a call from Tex Schramm at the uh, Dallas Cowboys, and he wanted a swatch of the paint so that he could paint the visiting locker room um, at their stadium. <laughs> so, uh, but that stopped real quick when high school sports in Washington state had already started using that, repainting the visitors' locker rooms, uh, this, this pink color. And uh, they would come out in the field and uh, be, then they would lose. And, uh, and they, were the, uh, the, they were not the underdogs. And finally, it went too far when a boxer at Madison Square Garden um, had these shorts made uh, by a famous designer uh, in New York, and uh, their robe, when they came out to start their bout, 
And the guy was a big underdog. And in less than about 20 seconds, he knocked out the opponent. And that's when all the professional sports banned the use of it, including in the, in the Olympics. Uh, the good thing is it can be used in facilities uh, such as public housing, where you can color the inside of, a, of an elevator uh, with this color. And they call it the Schaus effect. So that uh, if somebody was planning to aggress against you, at least it would take some of their strength away and you at least had a chance of defending yourself. Uh, interesting applications have been in special education classrooms where they used to um, um, have to deal with some students physically. They could now put them into a corner where they would create sort of a, a, a room uh, with, uh, uh, with these colors and it would calm the children down in just a matter of seconds. So it's been used in psychiatric facilities I get inquiries from journalists all over the world almost every single week. Uh, and remember, we discovered this right around 1979 is when we finally uh, published our first paper on it. So it's, it's, been, it's been quite an experience. I'm always fascinated by it. Now I understand why every year in Tucson, when you run that mineral dash against Rick Kennedy, why you're always wearing a pink shirt. So, ah, good okay. for you, Alex, but your secret is out. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. So the next dealer who sees me wearing pink, uh, he's probably got to put on the, uh, sunglasses or something, doesn't he? I got to work around that. That's so, right. If Alex is wearing pink, you know, he's looking for a brawl and he just wants to win at any well, I'm cost. Try, that's, I'm, I'm, that's I'm trying to get in. I'm, I'm trying to get a negotiating advantage. These prices have gotten too high sometimes. So I'm That's trying right. to see what I can do. We work within uh, my budget. <laughs> see, I love it. Now we're going to see all these pink clad people in Tucson. And it all is because of you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be real careful if you're into a meeting with an attorney. Some of the law firms now have one wall in this pink color. And they put uh, <laughs> the opposing side looking at it. <laughs> when they're negotiating and some of them just throw their hands up and said, okay, we'll settle. <laughs> All right. You <laughs> they don't know why. You're going to have to and talk to Paul outside. Hartner about that. <laughs> yeah. They walk outside in the hallway to go, what did we just do? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, Alex, we're now uh, at the part of our show where we have some Q and A's. And so I've thrown up a final image from you to represent the Q and A section. So uh, the second the girls can focus on that, there is a killer gold specimen that you like to call the question mark. I actually don't know what you like to call it, but it looks like a question mark. Tell us about this, and then uh, Raquel will um, respond with some of the questions that the viewers have. Yeah, this is the, uh, the new gold, uh, once the viewers see this, uh, from uh, the Azazag, as I guess it's called Azazag. Uh, province in uh, Quelman, uh, Uit, uh, Nude, uh, Morocco. Uh, they've been looking for more of these, and uh, up to now, all they're finding is just fragments of gold. But obviously, once you have a gold deposit, the military moved in pretty quickly to uh, protect the area, so they don't have a major gold rush there. But uh, fortunately, when these were first discovered, some dealers had some good relationships with some of the Moroccan uh, wholesalers down there. And uh, we're able to uh, get many of these specimens before they were turned into gold bullion. Uh, but this is a wonderful specimen because uh, it's got this gertite uh, block at the very end where usually the dot is in a, uh, in a question mark. So I called it the question mark. And it's a really beautiful specimen. That's a uh, Jeff Goldwell photo. Wonderful. Thank you. Raquel, do we have any questions from the audience that, um, that Alex can answer? Yes, definitely. We have quite a few. Uh, the first one, and that one comes from me. And we say <laughs> hi to Laura. I have been dying to say hi and see her. I see him passing by. Absolutely. Well, Let's get Laura on the camera. You're better half. I'd, I'd love to have Laura here, but she had to catch a phone. And, you know, she, she was on vibrate so that we didn't hear it. And she's out uh, talking to her mom right now. So Okay. So when yeah. she comes back, she could say hi. She, she also has an amazing collection herself. <laughs> she does. She, uh, Laura has a beautiful fluoride collection. And uh, she's enjoyed coming out to the Tucson shows. I, I began to come to Tucson in 1967 when I was a freshman at the University of New Mexico and have just 
come every single year with a couple of exceptions when I've had to do lectures all around the world and couldn't, couldn't get back here to Tucson in time. I've also enjoyed judging at the show and uh, sharing uh, you know, what I've learned from the many mentors I've had in my life, uh, especially with the younger competitive um, uh, case uh, holders. So, and their parents to kind of take them around the show floor and show them how they can improve their, uh, their collections. Hmm. Uh, so here goes, first question. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to put them together. What was but that? Like, I know, no working, right? Uh, do, do you do anything to preserve the marker sites and the pyrites? Uh, what about the marker sites? If you do anything to preserve them. No, I don't. Um, I, I, I appreciate the fact that many of us know that marker sites do fall apart, but it just seems some localities of marker sites um, stand, uh, withstand that type of loss even after a century, century and a half. And so those in particular is the ones that I would encourage if you would like to have some representation of car marker sites, good marker sites in your collection to get those. But I do not, I, I do not treat them in any way. Uh, Laura, uh, they just wanted to say hello to you. Oh. So. Um, Yay, hey, Laura. Oh, hi. <laughs> Great hello. to see you. We have been seeing you passing around, so we just wanted to oh. say hi. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Good, good to hear everybody and all the good, great questions. Hi, <laughs> Tom. Uh, someone asked if you have any books. Um, yeah, I've written 23 books. I'm actually working on my 24th book right now. I, I publish a lot of scientific papers that... Uh, are good for treating insomnia. They're very technical. They help people go to sleep. Uh, but the books, the books I write, I tend to bring down to more of a lay level. And the last book and related to mineralogy was Minerals, Trace Elements in Human Health, fourth edition. I think it was published in 1999. It's now out of print. Uh, people have asked me to um, re revise it and bring out a new edition. But uh, there's been so much research now done on the health effects of minerals and different elements that it would take a panel of 20 people to write that book today. Uh, I know the first time I tackled the subject, it took almost a year and a half uh, to just write that, that first book, the first edition, and then it took a little bit more time with each uh, subsequent edition, but that's a great book to learn fundamentals about minerals, about the earth, uh, where they're found, what they do, and how they affect human health. Hey, Alex, we have about half your face off the screen. Can you pan your camera? Yeah, there we go, well, much better. Well, the reason why I keep seeing the poll results on my camera. And you, just, you can close it, you can just No, no he might X. disconnect. Uh, okay, there, no, he done can it. Close it. All right, my, my apology. No worries. Alex, how many species, different species are in your collection? Um, there are 444 different species right now. Uh, the total collection is almost 1,250 specimens. Wow. So you need a higher seat as well. Any thoughts on collecting bare crystals versus crystal matrix? Well, I love um, having minerals, crystals with, uh, with matrix, I do. But when you're in thumbnails, you, there's some restrictions in doing that. Um, if you want to get, you can get a really superb um, crystal, but generally when they're with an association, they're around 1.6 to 1.0 centimeters on average or less. And so the question is, what would you like to show? The, the characteristics of the crystal uh, in a larger form, I tend to push it more toward 2.5 to 3.0 centimeters so that it's, it's, it's easier visually to see the, the crystal. But I, I also like associations, but I really think that's where Toenails are a great area to combine thumbnails with toenails. Not the seat. 
Um, Alex, we have some background noise. I think it might be from Laura on the phone. Yeah, Laura? Hold on, I gotta call you back. I gotta call you back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I felt like we were snooping. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what are the tools to you clean thumbnails? What do I what? What are the tools to clean the thumbnails? Oh, generally, um, I spend a little bit of time. First of all, I want to know uh, its water solubility. That's really important. For example, uh, very recently um, at one of the mines here uh, in Arizona, they found some fabulous calcanthites. And with it, for the first time, we found halotrichite. Now, halotrichite is a hot, extremely hydroscopic. And as it turned out, as soon as I was able to obtain that specimen, I rushed over to, um, I think it was Mark Monthan was available at the time, to take a photo of it. But within a month, all the halotrichite disappeared, even in this very dry Sonoran Desert environment. So that's an example of a type of, um, of a mineral when you have it in association. You almost have to seal it into nitrogen or something so that a moisture doesn't get in there. But I have a beautiful Alex, I've, photo. I've got an image of that that I'm pulling up on the screen uh, that you were just describing. Yeah, look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous? It's the first time they've ever seen that. So. And also the other thing that has been found in only a couple of, you know, two, three years ago, they finally found some concanthite that were actually jemmy. You could see through them, uh, had beautiful transparency gem unlike any of those that are normally very fibrous in nature and those uh were uh those were collected by michael shannon alex we have another question have you ever not bought a greater specimen because it's just oversized um no i've never done that no i've never done that i've not broken them down now, I, the dealers sometimes they laugh when i say well you, when I see a specimen I'd like to have as a thumbnail and I say, is there any, re is there any possibility you could pull it apart? I kind of stop myself from saying that out loud because I'd like to lead the mineral the way they, they found it uh, rather than to reduce it down to size. I think what has happened with the in growing interest in thumbnails is that we're beginning to realize a lot of things that we used to leave on the ground that was in the muck has value to collectors and uh, as revenue for people who are wholesalers and uh, and dealers. So I'm glad those are being preserved now. I know the first time I went in the Red Cloud mine, there were beautiful crystals on the floor, but they were all too small, according to the person who I was down. And he said, who would be interested? There's just little mm -hmm. fragments, but they were sometimes two to three centimeter beautiful window pane, clear, transparent, undamaged crystals laying on the ground. And I was shocked. Uh, and then I kind of educated him about thumbnails. Well, from that point on, he started, <laughs> you know, paying attention to them. And I, I, I hope more of that's going on around the world. And I guess last question, because we're really over time. He, Douglas asked early on, uh, as your expertise on toxins and poison, he would like to know if you have a couple of tips about what mineral collectors should know and be worried about while collecting, storing, and enjoying the collections from a toxins and from a toxicity and radioactivity point of view. Yeah, I do a lot of toxicology work today, and, and I've published you know scores of papers in toxicology and. Um, I don't think at this size, these type of specimens have caused me any concern, even though I know that part of their chemical composition includes highly toxic elements. Uh, and I don't mean just so radioactive, but things that ordinarily you don't even want to get on your hands. But um, these are too small a specimen. I think Fred Poe's point was um, don't take a big rock and start breaking it down because you could start inhaling some of the uh, particles and that might be a problem um, if, it, if you're doing that on a day-by-day -day basis. So a lot of this has to do with exposure and the degree of exposure of those elements uh, that get into your body. And then 
the difficulty the body has of getting rid of them. And, uh, and that's, uh, as an example with, with cadmium, which I mentioned earlier, uh, if you had uh, ingested oysters that were rich in, it's the richest source of zinc in the human diet, and then you were exposed to cadmium from whatever source, uh, you would be protected by the amount of zinc that had attached to uh, these, these compounds in the body that carry the zinc into cells. But if you don't get enough zinc in your diet and you're exposed to cadmium, then uh, cadmium has 20 times the affinity of attaching to these uh, transporters. And so after a while with repeated exposure, they start substituting for zinc in the cells. And then you get into some real serious problems, especially if it gets in the brain because it's highly neurotoxin and it's also carcinogenic in nature. So it increases your risk of cancer. So hope that that kind of answers the question. Thank you. I think uh, <laughs> we, we are done with another great episode. Thank you so much, Alex. That, that was wonderful. Well, it was delightful. And I'm so glad we had a chance to talk about thumbnails. And thanks so much for your program. I've tried to attend every single mineral talk I can. Uh, and when I can't, I know they're recorded and I have an opportunity to watch it later. So um, you're, you're doing something really wonderful. So although the pandemic has been extremely challenging for everybody the last 12 months around the world, uh, what uh, Blue Cap Productions and both of you have been able to do is uh, really fill in some of that wonderful time that we've had at home uh, to learn so much more from some wonderful curators, collectors, dealers. And uh, I just hope you keep doing this on for many, many more episodes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Alex. So I've learned, I've learned so many things tonight and a lot of people did. And I'm sure we got, we got a people, we're going to have people who will collect more thumbnails from now on. Thanks for or to your interview. So thank you so much. Now I know that I need to take uh, Alex Charles on uh, Into the Wild, surviving Into the Wild as well, uh, because you know everything about like recovering from any kind of poison and like <laughs> crazy <laughs> things from nature. That was amazing. I don't think that I've seen so many people interacting in the chat, asking questions. There were so many, so many questions. People were so amazed. We could not keep up. Um, but hopefully in what, two or three weeks, we will have the chance to see your interview again on the, on the YouTube channel on the, on Blue Cap. So that will give the chance for people to see everything again. And hopefully that will answer their questions as well. Thank you so much, Alex. That was wonderful. You're very welcome. Have a wonderful day. Alex, I always enjoy my time with you. And for those viewers at home, like uh, Eloise, they're coming out with the Ask Alex uh, app. So uh, you might want to download <laughs> that uh, on your next uh, trip out into the wild. <laughs> Ryan, thank you oh. so much. As you know, it's been a stressful week for my uh, for myself. Definitely. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, to be able to fit this in, I'm I'm so glad we could do this. And 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 Byron, thank you for being up so early in the morning. I know you're in Honolulu. Uh, and getting up at 4 a.m. was, uh, uh, you're a real trooper. And uh, what Blue Cap Productions has done has been fantastic. And uh, we can't thank you enough for what you're doing. I, I have an undergraduate degree in history, your chemistry. And uh, it, 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 it took your effort to finally realize the importance of, um, of hearing from so many people and, and uh, memorializing it in a way that will benefit generations to come. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Well, thank you. Thank you for the accolades. Uh, I, I accept it on behalf of Blue Cap and Raquel and Eloise. Uh, this never would have been possible if it wasn't for equal effort on all three of our parts. And so um, they are every bit, if not more, responsible for, uh, for what we're doing here on Mineral Talks Live. So uh, really appreciate the shout out. Uh, for all you viewers out there, tune in tomorrow to Blue Cat Productions' YouTube channel, and we are going to be posting our interview with Joe Doris that we did back on February 17th. That's episode 35. That will go live. I will make the announcements on Instagram and Facebook also. 
Uh, as for next week, unfortunately, we had a last minute cancellation. So um, we are shuffling the schedules around a little bit and we will be back to everyone shortly with who our guest is going to be next week. But until then, mahalo for joining us. Take care. <laughs>